Beyond Synth 368. You're listening to Beyond Synth Radio. Let's do this. You're tuned into the best place for awesome music and great chat. Beyond Synth is next. Hey there, welcome to the show. This is Beyond Synth, and today I am chatting with Holland. Holland's a cool guy. He makes like a cyberpunk, electronic style, atmospheric kind of music, and I dig it. And we actually talked for a long time, so I'm going to keep this intro fairly short. So I just want to say I hope you're all doing okay out there. And uh, thank you all to my awesome uh, Patreon and PayPal supporters. We have a new patron this week whose name i'm gonna mess up do you say timo or timo i only say that because i there was a person we used to call timo but i think that was a nickname so i'm assuming it's timo pesonen or is it pesonen this is the fun thing about names well i tell you what you let me know uh how to pronounce it properly and then i will but thank you so much for your support timo And thanks for uh, listening to the show. And for all of you who do support the show, if you watch the uh, Beyond Synth episodes I post on the YouTube channel, all your names are up there as well. There's like a banner that runs across the bottom of the screen with all the uh, Patreon supporters. And uh, I have a few more. I'm actually like a month behind, I think, on (laughs) posting those. But they're there to watch. It's just for some reason, because they're like two-hour videos, they take sometimes like five or six hours to render. And so I'll always render them at nighttime, the videos, I mean. And then I'll wake up in the morning and there's always an error the rendering always fails for some reason so I, my intention is always i'm going to post these episodes to youtube and then uh, i'll wake up in the morning and the render will have screwed up and then i need to use the computer for the rest of the day so i can't do any rendering and then i forget about the stupid video anyways the point is this i hope you're having a lovely day uh we're going to listen to a track by holland and then we are going to be chatting with Holland when the song is over. So I want to listen to this track from his album Virtual Nothing, which I believe is the newest one as of right now. And uh, it's a cool song. It's called Deeds Not Words. And uh, when the song is over, we will be in conversation with Holland. So this is Deeds Not Words by Holland. <laughs>
right. Well, I am here now with Holland, a.k.a. Mark. Is that correct? That's correct. How's it going, man? Uh, it's going good. Not too bad. Summer is here. Weather is good. Because <laughs> you live a few hours from me. Yeah. I'm just east of Toronto. So how's that going today? Is it cloudy? Is it sunny? Yeah, it's a little bit cloudy. Uh, it did rain in the nighttime, but it's not too bad. I was actually kind of surprised because uh, we had chatted before and I knew you were from, I think, like the Oshawa area. Is that yes. correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, way to be Oshawa. Yeah. So uh, then we just started chatting today and you've got an accent. I was like surprised that that's what you were going to sound like. Yes, I do have an accent because uh, I was born in Poland and I came to Canada at 13 years old. And at that point, you don't lose your accent yeah <laughs> <laughs> i have a sister that's uh, quite a bit younger than me and uh she has no accent at all but for me no i can't lose it i've been here for uh, quite a long time now so it doesn't look like i'm gonna lose it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so what was your family doing like why did you uh, move you know back in those days poland was communist right it was a communist country and my dad was in the opposition i don't know if you heard solidarity and all that stuff right so he was in the opposition and they were doing the protests and this and that and it got a little bit dangerous and you know my parents decided that maybe it's not the greatest idea to <laughs> raise a family in that kind of environment <laughs> so we left like did your family have any connections to canada none whatsoever uh you know like uh Canada, because, you know, Canada had a, has still has a very good rep reputation around the world, right? As a safe country, as a, as a good place to uh, raise a family, right? So my parents, basically, uh, we first went to Italy for a couple of years, right? So you had to, first you had to go to like a middleman country, right? And then you would apply at a consulate, right? Where you wanted to eventually end up. So you could, you know, apply to, uh, to go to the United States, Australia, Canada, right? And my parents decided that uh, Canada, if they would have us, would be the best destination. So then what do you do when you're in Italy? When we were in Italy, we, we stayed at this uh, refugee camp, essentially. So they, they set up these camps because at that time, a lot of people left, like a lot of people were leaving. And um, uh, the Italians were very nice. They were, they were amazing people. And uh, they set up these refugee camps and we had to stay there for a little bit until, you know, all the processing went through, you know, with the uh, Canadian consulate embassy. We had to go through an interview, like a qualification interview, if they would have us basically. And yeah. They, they accepted us. So how long did that whole process take? Uh, that took a couple of years. So I did get to go to Italian school for a couple of years and, you know, I got a taste of uh, Italian culture because we used to live just outside of Rome. So when you say you moved over when you were 13, yes. do you mean you got to Canada when you were 13? I got to Canada when I was 13, yes. I left when I was 11 and then I, I ended up here at 13 years old. So that's, that's what I'm saying about the accent, right? Like, right. <laughs> <laughs> so then what's the nature of those camps they set up? They were basically uh, facilities that they have, like, you know, like usually they have some kind of facilities, emergency facilities that they use for the local population, right? And they would uh, basically use them to house and feed the refugees, right? So at that time, it was uh, from Eastern Europe, right? Because of, you know, because of the communist systems and all this stuff, you know, large amounts of people were leaving. I, I guess, you know, whenever you hear the word refugee camp, there's a certain image yeah. that you see in your head. Or right. I do. So there's a, yeah, so that's, there's a difference of, uh, between uh, what we see today uh, you know uh, refugees coming from the Middle East and, and you know other parts of, uh, of the world and at the time which was you know almost 30 years or 30 years ago the camps back then yeah right because we were essentially Eastern Europeans showing up in like Italy Germany you know Greece were the ma main destinations right so they were basically essentially like hotels and emergency facilities that they used for their own population right 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 you know they, they, there wasn't some like difficult conditions or anything uh, they took care, like good care of us and and you know maybe these days it's a little bit different, right? Like, I have no idea how it is these days. Also, too, there's so many different places in the world where there's different scenarios for... Exactly. What's what's happening at the refugee camp? And so I know, like, if there's, like, yeah. a war going on or it's, like, some hastily yes. hastily put together yes. thing. Because when I hear that word, I just picture, like, tents in the rain with, like, mud everywhere and, like, people right, holding right. soup bowls and shit. And you know what? That is the case in certain places. Like, for example, in Turkey, like the Syrian refugees in Turkey, that's how it is. Mm. Right? That's how it is, like if you look into it. But back then, it was a little bit different. We were basically just escaping the system. You know, no war. There wasn't a war, you know. But, you know, the system was quite oppressive at the time. Like, Poland is a democratic country today. But uh, at the time, it wasn't. And it was quite oppressive. It was a police state. You know, heavy, heavy police state. You know, you couldn't say anything. You couldn't dissent at all, right? You'd get arrested and, you know, abused and no protest. And you know, none of that was allowed. No dissent whatsoever. So we weren't war refugees. We were basically, my parents were not 
World War refugees, but they were like, you know, system refugees where they they just didn't like the communist system and the way it was. And they wanted to go to somewhere that was free. Yeah, that was the goal. That was my father's goal. He was really bothered by that. Like, that's what he told me, right? Like he couldn't say anything. He couldn't, he couldn't, you know, because he, he'd get arrested, right? And he did get, he did get arrested. He spent like three days in the arrest and because they did protest, you know, solidarity and all that stuff. They did protest, mm -hmm. right, against the system. But uh, yeah, that's, that's the, you know, and Canada had a very good reputation, right? As a free country and still has, right? Like a free country and, and, and a peaceful, safe country. Wait, do you still have uh, relatives in Poland? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Now, look, I was a child at the time, but uh, looking back, I can see that it was very difficult for my parents to pack everything up and uproot ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, uproot our family. And I do still have cousins and uncles and, and you know, my my mom's family still there, my, my mom's brother and uh, sisters. And uh, they decided not to leave because it was, it was too much because it's not easy. You know, it's not an easy thing to just leave everything and go to a completely new country. You know, we didn't speak the language. We didn't bring any money, right? We basically came with our suitcases, but it was important enough for my dad, right? That he wanted to live, uh, at the time he wanted to live in a free country. That was that important to him. So how'd you go about, did you just learn the language just by living here? Or did you take classes? Yeah, or? so yeah, so I can't, listen, I came here <laughs> and the first day of schools, man, like looking back, like I, I did know some words, like everybody knows a little bit of English here and there, right? Yeah. Like, hello, hi, how, you know, my name is <laughs> this you. and that kind of thing, you yeah. know, <laughs> exactly <Yeah>. some <laughs> swear words. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Everybody knows a little bit, right? Like, you know, the world is so Americanized, right? Like movies. Listen, man, I was watching Aliens back in Poland in 1988, okay? Yeah, yeah, or yeah. 1989. <laughs> I, was, I went to see Aliens, okay? I saw Star Wars in like 1984, you know, back in communist Poland, right? So that, you know, the American movies were like all over the place, right? Like we were inundated with that stuff. So you do know a little bit of the language here and there because I was a kid, so I picked it up quick, right? It was, yeah. it was quite quick. So it took me about a year to start, you know, properly communicating. But yeah, the first months were not the easiest, right? When you can't really communicate. But but you know what? The school was amazing and the class and the people here were amazing. And I immediately made a lot of friends and very nice people, right? So I, yeah, immediately, you know, immediately made friends, you know, and, and we played Nintendo, NES and, you know, <laughs> Metroid and, and all that stuff, right? So I didn't even even speak the language that right? everybody was going to like sleepovers playing Metroid overnight and stuff like that, right? So see, there you go. The, the universal power of video games, bringing people together. Together. Banging people together, exactly. Um, well, look, before, we, so we've got your backstory now, so that's nice. Yeah. Uh, let's listen to some music, because uh, you make cool music. How would you describe sort of like kind of cyberpunk, ambient, industrial? Yes, exactly. So that's, it's really a fusion, because I'm into, you know, I am into synth wave, retro wave and all that stuff, but I'm also into chill out, a little bit of industrial. So, you know, when I was a kid, I uh, Front 242 was my thing, right? So I, there's like a big Front 242 influence on my music so a little bit of industrial a little bit of retro stuff you know video game soundtracks from back in the day i would call it a fusion of all those styles well let's listen to uh, some of that now uh, i want to listen to the track uh, which is a cool track called augmented reality from the augmented reality uh, album which is from 2015 it's a long time ago but i like to go through people's whole catalog when i talk to them because it's fun so uh let's listen to that and then we'll uh, we'll keep chatting this is uh holland with augmented reality.
And that was Augmented Reality by Holland. And I'm here with Holland right now. Mark, how do you say your last name? Uh, Rüdiger. Uh, so that's another interesting story because it's it's German. Mm. <laughs> so I have some German background, Polish, Ukrainian. Man, that part of the world, you know, because of all the conflicts and all that stuff, a lot of people are like mixed heritage. Do you actually spell it that way? Like R-Y-D-Y-G-E-R. Yeah. So it's Rüdiger. So this is the, this is the actual spelling of the... Because I thought it was fake. Because it looks like, it, for some reason, when I see I see with all the Y's in it, it looks like someone trying to make their last name look cool. Because it reminds me like, <laughs> what's that video game, Rygar? Yeah, Rygar. Yeah, yeah. yeah Rygar. Yes, yes. The barbarian guy with the, like, a, like, a, like a mace <laughs> thing. Yeah, I remember that. I played that back in the day. So when I see your last yeah. name, I just felt like, uh, is this yeah. real? <laughs> it is real. It is real. Um, because you know what? In, in the Polish language, uh, the way we pronounce words is the way you, because uh, the way you spell them is the way you pronounce, pronounce them. So uh, the English language which is a completely different way of yeah. uh, you know, the spelling. <laughs> yeah. right. That was a bit, yeah, by the way, that was a big, like, man, well, obstacle. No right? doubt. Yeah. There's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the things where I, I appreciate how fortunate I am to just be born into this language. Yeah. Because, um, you know, when we would learn, I'd learn like French and other languages, they have all these rules, you know, just like, oh, yeah. when you when you have this verb, it's got to end with this and it's got to have this yes. letter and this letter. And then Feminine, in English, masculine and all that yeah. stuff, right? And then, then in English, like it's just like, yeah. here's a word that several letters that you don't pronounce. Yes, it's an unusual language to uh, to like a European, like a mainland European. Sure. Right. It, it, it sounds it, there's there's a lot of things that are quite unusual. Yeah. Some of the silent letters, you have no feminine, masculine in this language. And, you know, European mainland languages are more, I, I think they're a little bit descriptive, right? They're a little bit more descriptive, precise, I would say. A little bit more precise. English is, English is quite ambiguous, right? Yeah, it's a complicated one. Like, I had this conversation with my mom because she's French and, like, was telling me about how much more, you know, descriptive French is because the yeah. inflection and masculine and feminine and all that. But right. English's strength is that it has the most words. <laughs> so in certain cases, the English thing is like easier and more straightforward to say because we just have a word for it. Right. But usually I just like making fun of French stuff to bug my mom. <laughs> you know what? So I, if I may interject a little bit, you know, because I grew up on uh, French comic books, mm. Mobius. Uh, I don't know if you know Mobius. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge influence or cyberpunk, like Blade yes. Runner. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mobius, right? Like, man, let me tell you, uh, French comic, you know, the industry and, and it's a huge influence in Europe. Like, huge. So mainland Europe was inundated too with French culture as well, like their movies, their comedies. And, you know, that's another uh, interesting thing. When I came here to Canada, like everything, you know, everything came from the States, right? Some Canadian art and movies and this and that. But, uh, you know, majority of it was just just America, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. right? And not a lot of European uh, stuff. Yeah, I think Quebec, you get more of the French imports. But in English speaking Canada, like our entertainment imports are mostly American. And then the mandated like 20% Right. Canadian content or, or whatever the percentage is, but like most of our commercials were Canadian. Yes. And like the educational content, like our weird uh, national film board movies like they'd show in school. You know, that, by the way, you know, that's what's interesting about that is that a lot of people took that sample, that stuff, like Boards of Canada. I know yeah. if you know Boards of Canada, oh, yeah, oh, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what it's from. And the National Board of Canada is they, they sampled a lot of that because Board of Canada, I remember in school, they used to bring their documentaries, like nature documentaries and stuff. Remember the TV they used to roll into the classroom? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the giant TV on that rack, man, that weighed like a hundred pounds, yeah. right, with the VCR. So they used to play a lot of those like um, National Board of Canada documentaries, like nature stuff. And the interesting thing about it, because that videotape, you know, over time it got so used up because they played it, right, to all the classes. Yeah. It had this like nice, cool, weird saturation distortion. And that's where like Boards of Canada and a lot of bands were influenced. They sampled all that stuff you know this weird late 70s early 80s retro stuff came about oh yeah it's that weird dreamlike nostalgia i get yes. when i hear some of those yes. samples where it's like you know the yes. volcano is a blah blah and like the, yes. it's got that voice and they, and they got that from those documentaries yeah. right <laughs> because you know it's like 70 cents right that they use that like some whoever yeah. did the soundtracks for uh the national board of canada right they were basically synth soundtracks yeah right like the early synth stuff like moog and and all that stuff right so it has some really cool synth work on it and and a lot of people sample that stuff because it's got the like you said it's got this weird dreamy nostalgic vibe to it right yeah, like yeah, that yeah. saturated tape sound that that modulates itself because of the tape got damaged right so it's like this weird pitch <laughs> pitch going on like shifting and all that stuff even like uh, come trues and stuff like that i hear it in his work 
yeah. those kinds of techniques. So huge influence on the scene, I would say, like not just the retro scene, but uh, many, you know, many scenes were influenced by the National Board of Canada. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because of the Canadian content rules, there were there were some things I watched as a kid that I didn't realize were specifically Canadian. Right. Like certain shows, commercials, or actually uh, certain foods and snacks like chips right like it was a uh, it was a long time before I found out that like salt and vinegar was a Canadian chip flavor because <laughs> it's my favorite flavor of chips and I assume that they were like popular everywhere yeah you're right there are some differences in branding and things like that right even though the companies are similar right e even now like it's hilarious how like just big corporations just own everything and so even like Tim Hortons yeah it's an American yeah no it's not even American and now it's I think it's like Brazilian oh you're right you're it's right like, I've heard, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> even though it's the big Canadian brand yes and like there's like a Tim Hortons on every block it's not even owned by a Canadian company yeah <laughs> That's just the reality, man. Big conglomerates, uh, they just snap up everything. Yeah. Well, how about we uh, fight back and uh, fight the power and listen to some cool music? <laughs> you know, it's actually tricky picking songs from you because, like, I find your stuff works sort of better as an album. Like, the songs have sort of a vibe that moves from one song to the next. So the songs on your albums are sort of... Um, Thematically similar. So with my albums, I always try to... Because there, there are no vocals in those things. They're instrumentals. So I do want to tell a story uh, thematically. So that's one of my big goals when I put out these albums. Right. And so we're going to move to the album Connect Isolate from 2017. Now, I had a few tracks I picked from this one. So what do you like better? Fractured Dreams or Surrounded by Silence? Surrounded by Silence. All right, let's do it. This is Surrounded <laughs> by Silence by Holland.
And that was Hall, and with the track Surrounded by Silence from the album Connect, Isolate. What's the name of that symbol? Because it's not a dash. It's not connect slash isolate. No, it's not a slash. It's a, what do you call it? I, I, don't, know, I don't know the name for that symbol. <laughs> yeah, I kind of, you know, it's kind of like, a, it's kind of like a, a line. Yeah, it's just a line because, it, you know, the theme of the thing is, you know, a lot of my stuff is a little cyberpunk themed and it's centered around the net, essentially, right? And how it connects us, but it also isolates us because we're not there in person. We chat to a lot of people, we talk, we make friends online, but you know, a lot of the people I've met online and I listen, I've made some like very interesting friendships, but I've never seen those people in person. Mm -hmm. They live their own separate lives and I don't really, you know, I know them online. I know their online personas, but I don't know them in, in real life. And that's kind of an interesting thing, right? That's new, right? Because it's only been around for like 20, 25 years, right? Since we started chatting online and all that stuff. Because before that, it was just stuff for nerds on BBSs. And, you know, I used to do that because I'm an IT guy, right? But I used to chat with people in like the early 90s on BBSs. You used to call in with your phone. Mom used to scream at me for taking up the line, you know? Because, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, it was over the phone. So the line was always busy in my house. Nobody could reach us because I was on a BBS, yeah, right? Yeah, I was yeah. sharing, uh, you know, shareware and pirating games and, and chatting with people. But anyway, yeah, there's this thing now where you make a lot of friends and friendships online. You know, it's quite interesting because you don't really know them personally. Yeah. Right? You just know that one side of them that they project through the screen. So I cover a lot of these like interesting dilemmas and, and things about the net and cyberpunk because it would listen man we live in a cyberpunk world if you think about it like i used to read all the cyberpunk you know uh, gibson and neil stevenson and all that stuff right and uh, snow crash and all that stuff right i read all that stuff back in the day and you know in, in some ways it's just not as cool you know like i would it's portrayed in those books we don't jack into a cyber deck yeah. you know <laughs> it's just it's just so much cooler you know like the, the way that all that stuff was described in the in you know the early cyberpunk books mm. man everything was so cool you know, cyberpunk is punk right it has this quality to it but now we live in this you know we live in this strange cyberpunk world where we do all those cyberpunk things right we're all connected we're all operating online making friendships living online lives in a, in a way but that also has an effect on your real life where you're not really making connections with people like real connections you're not seeing people like look at the younger generations like i'm a little bit older right i grew up you know when i was growing up it was essentially without the net it was the early days yeah right but i see my kids for example right like I do allow them a little bit, right? They go on the tablet, they play a little bit of Roblox, this and that, they make friends there. I do monitor all that stuff, but I see how they're growing up since they're little kids. And it's completely different than the way I grew up. Yeah, I, I noticed that too like with my son, because he's he's pretty much perpetually uh, online. And like, yeah, like yeah. one of his good friends is just a kid he met. Yep. Like they've never hung out or whatever. Yep, that's very common. But we're also a unique generation too, because we had that analog childhood. And for me, because like I'm born in 81. Right, I'm a little bit older than you, but around the same. Yeah, so like the internet that didn't come into my house until my last years of high school. Right. I didn't have higher speed cable internet until I was like in my 20s. Yeah. And like I resisted new tech stuff as well. Like I didn't get a cell phone until I was in my early 30s. People yeah. were using like GPS in their phones and I was still like printing Google Maps on paper. <laughs> but I've changed now. Like that's why I started using ChatGPT because I listened to a podcast talking about like the dangerous potential. And like for the first time, I'm like, you know, yeah. instead of resisting this, maybe I should know what this is, you know? <laughs> And like within two seconds of using it, I was super excited at the potential yeah. and I was like telling everyone I know like how awesome it is and like yeah. the other day I got it to organize my grocery shopping list by like the sections in the grocery store to make my shop more efficient you know like I'm an IT guy right like I'm a computer guy so I've been into this stuff for like decades and let me tell you I honestly think this is world changing event yes. that's happened yeah. this is a monumental shift like I don't want to under like I don't want to over dramatize it but this is a world changing technology and, and this is just the beginning of it and look at the impact that it's having already and this is just a start and i don't want to understate like we talk you know because i'm into cyberpunk and I, we talk about the singularity you know like humans meeting machines like you know melt uh, merging with machines and all that stuff but if you think about it i and i've talked about this with my friends who are also into this stuff and we all came to the same consensus that man, this is kind of a soft singularity. It's going to be so impactful. It's so intelligent in a way. Yeah, that's why I got so excited about it because yeah. even though the AI art sort of came first, or at least public consciousness, you know? Yeah. And I think it's interesting. Like when I see AI art, I'm like, okay, like it's cool, but it didn't excite me in any sort of way. I was just sort of like, okay, I get it. Like it's neat It's it, and it is neat. And I, I've been using the Photoshop uh, generative fill yeah. to make little matte paintings and stuff for videos. And I think it, it's pretty neat the way that it can 
sort of tell the perspective of your photo and it kind of matches the lighting with the things it adds in. But at the same time, I just see it as like, it's another tool in the arsenal of a visual artist. So I'm a little bit conflicted, if I may say, just because, you know, as an artist myself, um, you know, musician, because it's coming to music as well. Yes. Generative music, it's coming. And whether people like it or not, it's coming. There's going to be a day where Spotify, you're going to basically say what you want to hear the style that you want, and then maybe even reference an artist that you want it to sound like, and it's going to generate it for you. Like that day is coming. Yeah. Like I have zero doubts about it, that th this is basically no stopping it. So I have like mixed feelings about it. Well, okay, we'll, we'll keep talking about this because it's a fun topic, okay. but I want to listen to some more music first. Yeah. So let's go to Echoes of the Void. And again, I picked a, a couple from here. What do you like better, Identity Erased or Nothing But a Distant Memory? Nothing by a Distant Memory. All right, you like my second choices. That's, uh, yes. that's what I'm learning today. <laughs> All right, let's listen to this. This is uh, Nothing But a Distant Memory by Holland.
And that was Holland with the track Nothing But a Distant Memory. And I'm here with Holland right now, Mark. And uh, we're talking about uh, AI and shit. Well, like what I was saying before, the, the AI art stuff, I see it and it's interesting. It doesn't excite me. And it doesn't excite me if, like, you know, there's how there's these people who, like, they think they're talented because they knew what keywords to type in. Yeah, so that's where my mixed feelings come out uh, on this topic, right? Especially the AI art stuff. Yeah. Is that if you look at art, right? Like, uh, and, like people have different definitions of what it is and what it is trying to do. But to me personally, and, I'm, and I've talked to other people about this as well, it's art is basically a filtered, you know, a person experiences life and experiences all kinds of things in their life. You know, even, even media and this and that filter filters it out, they like filters it and outputs it. Like this is their vision. You know what I mean? This is what they perceive emotionally and intellectually. And you know, you get that human output, but AI, I mean, it looks good. And I'm sure the music is going to sound good someday when they perfect the algorithms. But man, it, it's just, there's nothing behind it, right? It's just algorithms. I mean, I know they train these things on, on, on real art, that they, they train them, they, they have to have data sets that they train these things on. And the way it, it, it's basically compositing algorithmically, and sure, yeah, it looks great. I mean, Mid Journey, some of the stuff I've seen uh, generated by Mid Journey, I mean, it's, it's mind blowing, but there's no artist behind it. And to me, a lot of art, I was always fascinated. You know, when I started like getting into music and visual art and all that stuff, I was always not just fascinated by the music, but, but by the people behind the music or the visual art. Mm. It's like, what, what made them do this? What experiences in life, you know, what did they perceive? I can recognize in terms of the visual art, I can recognize that something is cool. Yeah but it doesn't excite me when it's AI generated. So I'll look at it and go, that's neat. And I've seen some pretty neat things where it's like, oh, like the AI came up with some interesting armor designs or whatever, you know, like for a fantasy film. Right. I can see that I see the potential as a tool for people who are already creative in the same way that George Lucas you know, when they're doing Star Wars, would hire all of these artists yeah. and say, give me some alien designs. And then he gets to walk in the room and look at a fucking wall of all these artists who have produced, you know, like 30 images of here's what a, you know, flingle floor should look like. Right. And then George Lucas just walks up to the wall and goes, I like number three, I like number four, and then he leaves. And so the exciting thing for me about AI stuff is that I get to do that as a person now and not have to be George Lucas. So like if I'm trying to come up with some concepts, I can just keep hitting generate, 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 right? Yeah. Now that I've seen all of these options, I can then decide I like option six and then use that to either base an actual design on that I make or, or for example, if you are like a contract artist, right? And you know, you work for yeah. somebody, for people who, who work as professional artists, they will tell you the most annoying thing is dealing with clients who can't decide on what they want and you have to go through all of these iterations before someone will, you know, the, the client will agree or whatever. That is completely correct. People usually people don't really know what they want when they're commissioning a piece of because i did i have a little funny story it's not, not so long a german a german industrial company that they made it some kind of an advertisement video and it's like this i don't even know what these machines are but it's some kind of precision machinery and they commissioned a track from me yeah. out of nowhere <laughs> yeah that was like the most bizarre thing ever like a german company just contacts me out of out of the blue and they make this weird precision machinery and i'm like what kind of track do you want and they don't know i i guess somebody in their market Marketing department came across my stuff on maybe SoundCloud or YouTube or something and they liked some of the work but they couldn't really decide what they wanted so you're completely correct it took me quite a bit to nail down what they really wanted for this thing so this is the main problem I see the the two sides in this sort of AI debate and I understand both of them on one hand to train the AI it's training on actual images yeah if so, for example, like, and, and I, I completely understand that. So if all of a sudden I'm watching a TV show and I see that they've used something that I can I can totally go, that's my art. Like the, the fucking algorithm has taken the picture I drew and sort of warped it around. But I can see my art in that. Yeah. Then obviously you deserve to be compensated. But on the flip side, I think there's a lot of people who are complaining who aren't necessarily professional artists who some of the frustration of the work is just the iteration process. And if you can cut that out, like if you can go to a client and before you even do anything, like they're like, hey, I'm doing a campaign for chocolate bars and I want like a happy kids in front of like a park or whatever. And then you just go to the AI and say, okay, fucking happy kids, park, balloons, chocolate bar. 
and then the AI generates a bunch of things that you show the client and go, which one do you like the most? And then you didn't have to go and draw or Photoshop. Because like, the thing is, a lot of people, when they complain about the AI stuff, it's like, okay, well, if you're a professional visual artist who works on commission like this, well, then you would have been sourcing images anyways from Google or uh, from stock photo agencies while you were trying to cobble something together. And you know what? That is correct. And by the way, art in itself is imitation, right? A lot of it. Let's be honest, man. Like I listen to uh, tons of artists and I think I look, man, I'm not going to say here and I say everything I do is completely original. I hear something I like and I, I try to put, you know, recreate it and put my own little flavor on top of it. I'm already doing that. So AI is essentially doing something, but it's doing on a bigger scale. Things that excite me is when I see the potential of how I can use it yeah. to help me do creative things. So right now, the Photoshop generative fill tool excites me because I go, hey, I can make a short film now and I use Photoshop to make matte paintings. Yeah. And it's cool because I can literally film in front of a door. I've got like maybe like one square foot of uh, space and now I can make it look like I'm in a big room. Right. And there's this editing tool that's uh, AI powered now uh, that I can use on Premiere that it can basically go through my timeline and change the camera based on who's talking. And so that's something that, yeah, if, if that was like a two hour interview and you know, you've got like three cameras cameras that would have taken me like four hours to like yeah. scrub through and change the camera and stuff and you know the ability to be able to do more stuff myself that's what excites me but at the same time I totally understand if you're like hey they're stealing people's images to feed the algorithm of course that's wrong and like there should be programs where you can scan artwork on the internet or movies and scan to see if like fragments of your art have been used I think they can do that these days they, they can actually recognize it can actually spot. So I, I agree. Like, I don't think it's cool for people to steal. And I think even that argument that all art is sort of borrowing, that's true. But since it's still filtered through a person's head, yeah, it's different yeah. than when a computer is yes. literally borrowing <laughs> like yeah. someone's and, style. And, and algorithmically yeah. compositing, you know, everything that it's learned. I mean, from what I read, it doesn't actually compose it. It learns and it discards all that stuff. So that stuff, it actually doesn't copy anything, mm. right? The algorithm learns and what it's learned, I know it's hard to comprehend like how an algorithm can learn this and just discard the data because that's what they do. I think they discard the data so they don't actually like copy and compose it. You know, taking like a million images, looking at them and then compositing bits and pieces from them. That's not actually how it works. It learns all these patterns and, and, and things and then discards all that stuff. And then it starts working, compositing algorithmically. But from what it learned, yeah. not from the data. Like I'm completely mixed on this, right? Like I have such conflicting feelings on this. I am conflicted on just the stuff that's purely AI generated. So if someone just posts a video that they just went into fucking um, runway AI. And so some of that stuff is like again either either they have to figure out and i i do agree like there's got to be some legislation because we got to figure out like are you allowed to copyright something because you typed in a few keywords yeah um who gets the copyright is it the Excellent. company yeah, there's that's a minefield you know that's a brave new world and that's the stuff that really needs to be thought about yeah. and i think adobe is sort of I, my understanding is that they're sidestepping it because the things that they're training their algorithm on is the stuff that's in their adobe stock footage database yeah and so that to me is like okay well that's a solution right like if your AI is trained on images you own the rights to but then it still sort of asks the question like well if I just go into your program and type in like fucking uh, sexy lady running down the road with a machine gun <laughs> do I get to copyright it if I didn't do anything I don't think you do but I then does Adobe get to copyright but, but the, it like exactly that's exactly. the weird who part owns the image like who owns the work that's that but you know what that's one of the aspects we're talking so I noticed that we're talking a lot about like the monetary compensation side of things. Yeah. But my concerns, and I, so that, that when I, as I'm watching this, by the way, it's moving at breakneck speed. Oh, yeah. The improvements are just insane. Like it's moving so fast, exponentially. And uh, so one of my concerns is that is because like, you know I carved out a little bit of an audience. Uh, it took me years to carve out a little bit of an audience on Bandcamp, SoundCloud. You know, I I have quite a few fans that I've been dropping tracks. You know, working hard for years. My concern is that you saturate the scene because you already have a lot of music out there and a lot of, well, you know, images, of course, right? But I'm, I'm talking about specifically about music. When they come up with the music algorithms, they'll be able to just do anything. They will saturate with, you know, everything will be so, there'll be so much stuff out there, mm. right? There'll be so much that if you're like, 
and a starting out artist, you're like starting out and you want to carve out, build an audience. Like how with with AI everywhere and everybody, you know, listening to AI generated tracks, like how do you build an audience in, in, in such an environment? I'm sure there will be people that would always prefer, you know, human made essentially, right? Yeah. There will be a niche. There will be always people that always prefer like, no, this is human made. I want to hear it. I want to listen to music that's made by people, right? But a lot of people won't because it's a lot of it is convenience. You launch Spotify, you put in, uh, I want some synth wave, something like a mix of calm truths with like laser hawk or something, right? And then the <laughs> thing will generate it because a lot of people listen to music for convenience. It's convenience, right? Like it's, they, they want something in the background, some good tunes, makes them feel good, you know, elicit some emotion in people. Like I personally do care, mm. like who's behind the music and who made it and how they made it. And I listen to their stories. I listen to the, you know, I like listening to artists interviews, like who they are, what they, you know, where they came from, what they're about. But a lot of people don't. Like tons of people don't. Music is just a utility to them. And then, you know, they put it out in the background, they go take a shower or something, yeah. you know, while it's playing or this and that. So I'm I'm kind of like interested where this is going to go when you're starting out, right? Like I'm older now. I, I've been around for a while. I've been doing this for a while. I carved out a little bit of a niche for myself. But if I was starting out now and I saw all these things happening around me, man, I'd do a double take. I'd say to myself, maybe I should concentrate on something else, do something else, right? Like where I can express myself. Because let's be honest, I want people to listen to my tracks. I want to share them, you know? Like I, I don't really care about the you know, monetary side of things because if, if I did, I wouldn't be making this kind of music. It's a very niche style, and but I do want people to listen to it. I want to share, you know? I want to share my experiences, my vision with other people. And if nobody shows up, right? Because in the future, let's say they, everybody goes to Spotify or other services like YouTube or something, and they listen to like AI generated stuff because it's going to be good. You know what? People say, oh man, it's going to be too perfect. Everything's going to be just so like clinical and precise. No, you know, the AI is going to, if you say today to an AI in the future, you will tell me, make it, make it like an imperfect sounding track that has like the production is kind of like basement level production. It will do that for you. Mm -hmm. it, it won't just be perfect EDM on the dot, perfectly produced, you know, not, not just that. It's not going to be that. You will be able to even generate like a garage band style track for you. You know, once once the algorithms approve and, and there's enough processing power, it'll be just be able to do anything. So my worry is not just the mon monetary side of things, but also people don't show up to listen to people's music, right? And people just not going to be doing it because majority of artists and, you know, I know a lot of people say I do this for myself right? And I need to express myself. I do this for myself, but that's not the case. Like artists do this because they want to share. They want a shared experience with, the, with their audience. Myself and I, I've talked to other artists as well about this. And everybody says that, man, if there's no audience, that, 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 why, why should I be doing this track for myself, man? You know, like I, I'll just do some other type of expression. Like it's hard. To, by the way, it's also incredibly difficult to predict where this is all going to go. Like, sorry about my long rant, but I've been thinking about this a lot because, you know, it does affect all of us, like artists and even small artists, like big artists, Ah, they, they, they don't really care, right? They'll sell their image. Like big artists all are, are, are about the image, brand and image. Yeah. So it's like, it's not really about the music. Like me personally, for me personally, I just put out the music out there, right? Like I don't even take a lot of photos of myself and I don't really put out YouTube and this and that. But in, I understand in this day and age with the younger people, they, you know, you have to have a YouTube presence. You have to have some gimmick going on, you know, if you want to hit it big. But now AI comes into play. Oh my goodness. You know, it's very difficult for me to predict where this is all I do. I'm just worried that a lot of people will basically because of because you know people love convenience. You know, people do love convenience. Like look at Spotify, for example. You know, there's been, there there was this big brouhaha with Spotify where Spotify doesn't pay a lot per stream. They don't pay artists. And yet they have such a huge audience and and it's so convenient. And look, man, I even go to Spotify and and because it's so convenient, right? And and I pull up some playlists and this and that, and it's just too convenient. So now imagine Spotify has an AI component to it. I'm not worried about the big mainstream artists. They'll find some way to monetize this stuff, but I'm worried about the little artists, the, the small guys in the basement, small guys in the garage, you know, that want to share their work and that just nobody's going to show up and listen to it. That's my big worry. No, I get it. Like it, I think for me, I just need to hear what they come up with because so far, if it's anything like the visual art, right there is a weird disconnect i feel where i look at it and i've seen you know like people put those videos on youtube of like you know what mm. if this was an 80s fantasy italian movie? italian breaking bad what if breaking bad took place in Italy? Yeah, and, some, and some of them look really cool <laughs> but there's part of me that goes I, I appreciate that this looks cool yeah and yeah i i would like to see in the case of like some of the science fiction ones i've seen mm -hmm. wouldn't that be neat to use these as templates for designs for an actual movie right right and and you know what it's going to be used and and artists will use this and 
and are using it already because you know game studios and and other people are using and are starting to use these tools like this is the world changing paradigm here like it's not going to be some massive like overnight everything changes no it's going to slowly creep in you know and 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 these tools are going to be absolutely everywhere right and you know what i'm talking about this i'm, I'm saying i'm worried about this and this and that but you know what it's not going to stop it it's going to happen. Yeah. There is no stopping this. And we have to adopt. In my opinion, we'll have to adopt in some way. And um, we'll have to make each of us, we'll have to, like artists and other people, we'll have to make a decision. Well, I tell you what, my decision right now is to uh, <laughs> is to listen to some music. You have an album called uh, Nothing But Stardust. And uh, there's a track on here called The Self Vanishes, which I think is cool. It also works thematically with what we're talking about. It absolutely does, I think. (laughs) (laughs) So let's listen to this. This is uh, The Self Vanishes by Holland.
And that was Holland with the track The Self Vanishes from the album Nothing But Stardust. And uh, I'm here with Holland right now, Mark. And it's funny because we just we just talked a whole bunch about AI art. But the reason I was interested to talk about AI was because I was excited about ChatGPT. Right. Like the AI art is fun. But like when I first started using ChatGPT, that's when I felt yeah. the same feeling when I used like an iPhone for the first time. Like it just hit me like, yeah. oh, this is big. Like the potential of this is huge. Yes. Especially for like data sorting. Like I can't wait till I have like a chat GPT in my operating system to sort my files. And it's coming. It's coming. Microsoft is working on it for sure. To me, that's what's exciting is I obviously there's weird privacy things that is, someone's going to hear me say that sentence and go like, they already oh, you do. want some fucking company stealing your shit? <laughs> okay. <laughs> By the way, they already do. Yes. They, uh, yes. You're, you're being, listen, you're being tracked. You have a cell phone. You have a, you have a computer, mo modern computer with a modern an operating system you have a cell phone you're being tracked they know quite a bit they know quite a lot you know it's just a new reality and that sucks obviously but like the thing is like i have so many files yeah <laughs> like unlabeled photos yeah like twenty thousand synthwave songs like the potential to get all of that organized would be amazing absolutely like i also love the ability to like summarize internet articles seeing yeah. that most of them are just time wasting bullshit anyway i don't know if you know the term content farm yes basically that's, exactly. Yeah. Fucking content farm. Like, cause I read a lot of movie news and video game news yes. where there's like one sentence worth of information, but you have to read like some teasing headline. You know, it's like <laughs> Guillermo del Toro had some interesting things to say about this Pinocchio star. And so like, I, I want to direct the AI to that website and just say like, summarize this, you know? Yeah. Okay. Guillermo del Toro enjoyed working with Ewan McGregor great you know like that just saved me time and annoyance yeah. and i can't wait until i can use it to organize my files just like hey chat gpt like go through my photos yeah. from 2018 and label the files and organize them by people in the picture and location and date done yep. like that's just busy work and like i'm excited to remove a lot of busy work from my life and focus on like what matters because like yeah. with beyond synth for example all that really matters is having a cool conversation with someone recording it editing it and posting the episode for people to listen to like what doesn't matter is everything else yeah. the hours i've spent inputting data into a spreadsheet collecting artist links condensing the episode discussion into like a paragraph formatting that paragraph and links for like different specifications of all the different social media accounts like yep. keeping that data updated and like you know cool people like uh the ethan and christian have like helped me with that but it's it's just busy work that has nothing to do with the actual podcast it's tedious yeah it's tedious be busy work yeah so that's the stuff where it's like yes if i was rich i would hire an assistant to do that stuff but i'm not and so if it's the case that there's a tool that's gonna go hey i give it the transcript of my episode and i say write a paragraph that just condenses what we talked about into a thing just so people know and and fill it with hyperlinks and it just does it that to me is like i'm excited for shit like that and I'll have to agree. Like, as when it comes to those case uses, it's going to be an incredible tool. Like, a personal assistant, like a more advanced personal assistant, it's just going to mind blowing. And it's a very good use of the technology, right? Like, I agree with it. Yeah. As an assistant, that's going to be incredible. That's where I'm excited. I am not excited for I'm going to fucking scam somebody by pretending to be their yeah. mom by scanning their texts and then like yeah. making it an AI. You know, the deep fakes and all that stuff, right? So, Obviously, yeah. that's bad. But for the the assistant thing, like when I first started using ChatGPT, and again, when I say use it, maybe like once or twice a day, even though I'm paying money right. for it, but like once or twice a day, I ask it a question. Yeah. But it's so cool that it answers the question. There's a lot of times my mind gets stuck. And as I get older, I'm, I, you know, there's plenty of times where I'm just like, what the fuck is that thing? Yes, <laughs> I'm, I'm there with you. <laughs> when you use Google, you have to know the right word. Sometimes yeah. you're searching forums for two hours because it's like, what's that tool in After Effects where you 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 sort of warp the screen, but it's like, and it, how do I word this in a sentence where I will find the tutorial I need online? Yeah. So I love when I go into ChatGPT, I can be like, what's that tool that's like a kind of a triangle symbol? I think it's in like the corner of the screen when I'm using Photoshop. And then it just goes, you know, 
oh, I think the tool you're thinking about is this. It gives me the word. Then I can then use that word, go into Google. Concentrate on the work itself rather than, you know, like the, what you want to accomplish. Yes. And I love that it understands the context when you're writing questions that you can write it in your own language and it parses it and gives you the answer that you're looking for. And then so it saved me time in that regard because like, well, obviously you're a fucking IT dude. So yeah. you know what it's like to fucking search through nerd oh. forums on Reddit for four. Oh. You know, you're on a forum for like fucking yeah. four hours searching yes. for something. Some kind of a solution to a problem. Yeah, absolutely. I've been there, man. I've been there. You know, and then you get those situations where you finally find you type in your problem and there it is. The Google search pops up. How come when I when I'm using this tool in Final Cut, the screen goes black? Finally, someone asked the right question. You click on yeah. the link and no one has responded. And you're on some fucking like Yahoo answers and someone asked the exact question you wanted to know and there's fucking no responses. Yeah. Or the only response is some nerd going like, well, why would you want to do it that way? You know, when I do this, usually I use this tool. I'm like, that's not what the fucking guy's asking. Answer the question the guy asked. <laughs> There's always that person who joins the fucking forum and yeah. just complains about the question the person asked. And it's oh, like, man, these, uh, why are yeah, you here? Technical forums, man. Dude, it's if like, like, oh my God, why would you do it that way? Why would you do it that way? How about answer the fucking question? How about that? This happens all the time. Like in IT, man, if you're running Linux or something, those Linux nerds, man, <laughs> or you're running a Linux server and you want to ask, you're running the wrong distro yeah. or you're doing this or you're doing, oh my God, man, just, just, just. And this is, yeah, this is a very common problem. You're absolutely right about that. This is a very common issue, yeah. I also see a future where I don't have to go on nerd forums anymore, yeah. where or I'm not judged for the question I asked. You know what I mean? You just go to chat yeah. GPT. Hey, I'm in After Effects and I want to move a layer, but it doesn't seem to move when I press the mouse. Why mm -hmm. is that? And instead of some nerd going like, <laughs> why would you want to move it in the first place? Who gives a fuck? You're, you're using the wrong method or you're, using, you're doing it the wrong way. Or there's always like that, that person who, yeah. and, and yeah. chat GPT just goes, you probably can't move the layer because uh, it's locked. And here's some tips on unlocking the layer yeah. press l blah blah yeah. do, you know do this stuff and yeah. that's what i accomplish need. your task accomplish your goal yeah it helps no listen man this is a le absolutely legitimate use of the tech yeah it's going to be absolutely brilliant for quite a lot of things man it's going to change a lot of how we do things a lot you know even on the professional level right like man it's going to change a lot we're on like a new ground here this is a brave new world and you know a lot of it is going to be very positive for sure and and useful that's the problem with everything now I'd like and the internet is the number one thing that is both the best and worst thing at the same time. That's ever happened to humanity, man. Yes. I, I, and you know what? I completely agree. I've been on it since the beginning, basically, because, you know, of my job and profession. And I completely agree. It's, it's absolutely the best thing that's ever happened. You know, you have so the vast amounts of knowledge and the things I've learned, you know, the things I've read, then I would have never gotten that mm -hmm. if I, you know, if I didn't have access to the net. But it also brings out, you know, the trolling and the Oh man, there, there's a lot of bad things happening, right? So it's so hard because for all of these conversations I get for people listening to the show right now, it's hard to sit there and listen because like everyone has their own like subjective opinions on these things and they're all valid when something is both really awesome and really shitty. Yeah. So you listen and if you hear in my voice, I'm all excited about like the potential of chat GPT yeah. and I am. But yes, and, on and, the flip and, side, and I think you should be, and I think, I think most people should be excited for some things. But you know, there, there's two sides to this, right? There's two edges to this sword, right? So yeah, if someone's malicious, yes, there's, <laughs> they could use this to do some really bad things. Yeah, it's not that I'm being naive. I truly see the potential. When I see the potential for something, that's what excites me. You know, we, I don't, I don't think we should be all doom and gloom. I don't think we should be. I think we should stay pretty positive about this. And be aware. Like, that's the thing. Yeah, it's just, be, it's aware, a, yeah. be aware. Be yeah. aware because I think it's too late for things like, you know, social media. If we knew in the beginning. What it's going to do. Yeah. So, so many positive things. Yeah. But then I think social media should be the lesson for the future of like, okay, when we get some new tech in here that seems really exciting, let the people who talk about the negative aspects really hear their voices and act upon them early because for social media it's too late like if there was people at the beginning going like hey man listen this is all cool we get to connect with old friends from high school and share pictures and stuff it's all real good um just know 
that people will be able to spread some fucking vicious shit using this technology yeah. and we should probably get ahead of this because it's going to be bad and also the way it fuels like people's personality changes when they're online you know it's like so the things that people say online yeah. the shit they say online is they're not those people in real life you know mm -hmm. like that tech even the way they portray like people portray their lives in on, on social media right like they're not those people in real life you know what i mean like and, and then what they portray and what they do and how they behave specifically on social media and like Man, it's it's like look at TikTok for example, right? The 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 the, the format of the short video, yes. right? Like the short little video, you can't get into like the deep form, like deep you know content because it just shows you like little clips and looks like look how it conditions people. And I am uh, conditioned to listen to cool music, <laughs> so uh, let's listen to another Holland track and then we'll keep talking. Uh, this is another one from the Nothing But Stardust album. This is Currents of Time.
And that was Currents of Time by Holland. And I'm here with Holland right now, Mark Rittiger, and we were uh, just talking about social media and how horrible it is. And uh, yeah. I do have to say, like, my main resentment towards these social media companies is that they could be doing so much more to make these positive places because yeah. I pay attention to what they show me in my feed. Like when I use YouTube, for example, I don't sign in with my Google account. I just watch it with a fresh browser. Yeah. And because I'm always curious, like how quickly are they going to show me shit that's designed to make me mad? That's another thing. They feed on the way that because they want you scrolling. Yes. They watch you watching. And the way that human beings work is the negative stuff hooks you unfortunately and what bugs me is the companies play into that that's what pisses me yeah. off like yeah. they know okay i can show you fucking stuff that's gonna make you angry sex stuff and if i literally and i'm a man right so like it's hard right. if you show me a picture of some here's a chick with her jiggling boobs yeah it's really hard for me not to look at that right because <laughs> it's something that i like to see yeah ev evolutionarily programmed by nature right it's just the way it is and so what bugs me is they could be doing so much more to be positive forces like when i go on my instagram it's literally i follow musicians and i look at videos of cats yeah and like that's pretty much it but when i go to my for you thing it'll still be oh but you want to see pictures of like ladies boobs right and like some mm. hot asses and if i mm. even click on one of those then the the fucking thing is full everything algorithm, i scroll through yeah. algorithm is going to pick that up and and yeah, it's, it's gonna, and i'm like yeah. well fuck you guys i literally look at music and cats all day yeah. why are you not flooding me with cats and music why is it that the second they're like but you but you want to see some titties right yeah that's also an interesting thing right because that happens to like i think that happens to me as well i only follow musicians right mm. other musicians because i'm interested in like who they are and what they do but you know sometimes like you know there's some news about the war in ukraine or something like that right yeah. and i'll watch some like like pretty grim video right somebody then it starts feeding me man everything's war war you know conflict war man and i just i i, I don't think i want to see like my whole feed being it's well, and you, it's strange that's yeah. what bothers me because i don't like the way that it tests like see tiktok does this too they want to test you test yeah tiktok's the worst yeah and it's like why not just show animals cute animals science uh movie clips uh you know sports highlights or whatever yeah but it goes very quickly to, I just showed my wife this this morning. Yeah. I don't use TikTok at all other than I'll post some of the same videos I post for my Instagram. I'm like, look at this. Today, I, I literally opened it up. I only follow other people in the synthwave scene. So far, I've only posted like three videos of my cat, okay? Mm. And then I go, I click on For You. Last night, I watched a video of someone making a really gross meal and people commenting on it. Like, what the fuck are you doing, lady? Because uh, she was making this disgusting dish. Yeah. And then um, this morning, my first thing, I scroll up, For You. First video is uh, some topless lady with things covering her, her nipples getting a, like a massage massage on her boobs yeah. okay and i'm like look i'm a guy okay obviously i like that yeah but <laughs> but the thing is how dare you show that to me first like you could have shown me anything no, i think that's deliberate i think that's it is deliberate. and it's, it's they like the, they're yeah. testing me oh you're a perf huh yeah. well of course i yeah. am i'm a fucking guy <laughs> it's done deliberately yeah that's what bugs me that's malicious to me because i'm like hey fuck you because they know they're gonna go right into my fucking brain and go like oh you like this don't you and i'm like well yeah but like yeah that's not what i want to use this platform for and i know yeah. that since i looked at that video for more than two seconds now the every time i scroll up it's gonna to fucking completely forget that I like music, completely forget that I like looking at cats, and now it's going to be like, oh, you like boobs, huh? Yeah, that happened to me with the Ukraine war. <laughs> I watched one Ukraine war video, some soldiers fighting in the trenches, or this, and a very quite brutal video, and it's just my whole feed was just all that grim war stuff, and I'm like, man, from time to time, yes, I'll seek out, you know, something that I want to look, something like that, but just don't show me the entire don't feed the, the yes exactly 50 ton, you know like the whole feed is full of that stuff just show me my the regular stuff that i watch which is music which is art yes you know popular culture movies you know i'm, I'm hugely into movies obviously uh music movies you know that kind of stuff right so it's uh, I, that's what i want you know majority of my stuff but no that's not what they do no they they they, they you know that they, they it's it's you know what it is it's governments are not keeping up with the tag you know when it comes to regulation yes they definitely right? like because i would 
again, I mean, if I was, uh, you know, if I was in control, yeah. but I would just have rules where it's just like, ironically, some of these rules are like <laughs> what they do in China. Yeah. Uh, but just yeah. for this one specific thing, it's like, look, on social media, there should just be a rule where it's like, first of all, if you're a certain age, it should be like illegal for the algorithm to show yeah. you certain things that anyways. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. So that's agreed. an immediate thing. Again, if you want to, as an adult, it's your choice. Okay. You can opt in. Yeah, you can opt in. If I want to yeah. look for boob videos, I can search for boob videos and that's my choice as an adult. But the algorithm should never go, yeah. hey, you know what you want to see? Uh, some police beating the shit out of some guy. Yeah. Yeah. For some reason, the algorithm is always feeding negative. Yes. Like, it goes very dark very quickly. Yes. And I, you know what? I think that's deliberate. I think that's deliberate. It must be. I, I would I would say that would be the law I would regulate would just be like, look, yeah. fine. You know, you're a socially conscious person and you like watching videos of police beating people up and you want to bring awareness to that. Fair enough. That's your choice. But that should be a choice. Yeah. It shouldn't be, hey, I'm looking at cute kitten videos and I scroll up and yeah. oh, here's some Karen yelling at somebody in a fucking parking yeah. lot and someone like slamming. Very under- negative. Yeah. Very negative like experiences and, and you know, circumstances. Yeah. And the, unfortunately, governments are not keeping up with this stuff, right? When it comes to regulations, right? And they used to regulate the media. Remember, they used to regulate the movies. Mm. They used to regulate music. You had the, remember the labels yeah. that uh, <laughs> advisories and all. Remember back in the 80s yeah, and yeah. stuff like that? Advisory. Like when we used to listen to hip hop, like I came from like hip hop, metal. I, you know, I listened to everything back in the day, metal, hip hop, electronic music, synth, all kinds of like oh, stuff, right? But, uh, you know, the more the more explicit stuff, there was always label- labeling on it and this and that, right? But with social media, you have none of that. It's like the Wild West, right? The, the, the social media companies just do what they want. Yeah. And the governments, for some reason, um, they're not doing much like other countries do. I'm not talking specifically like China because China is very heavy handed. Well, right? yes, obviously, like I just think it's ironic because what they do with TikTok, yeah. I don't hate the idea of it. I mean, obviously, I wouldn't want to live yeah. in China, but like yeah. the idea that it's just like, hey, every four videos, they show you something else. Like it's just like, yeah. Like an educational video or something. And obviously, like they do, they do. They have their own version, right? And they, they promote like science and you know, and also and, their and fucking learning, communist and, party and shit. Well, so obviously, you know, that that comes with the territory, right? Like I come from a place where it was a communist, right? So that's like you know, the loyalty and and obedience to the party is like the number one thing. Yeah. So that sucks. It does. Yeah. But I think there's a lot of positive things you could do. Like just imagine if like even if by choice you're scrolling through a whole bunch of negative shit. Yeah. Every four videos is just. Hey, here's some animals getting along with each other. Hey, here's a cool science experiment. Hey, here's a movie trailer. Hey, here's a clip of a new song. Even if you don't like the yeah. music, at least it's like yeah. every every so often it just goes, here's art. Yes. Here is a positive human interaction of people getting along. Yeah. Scientific discovery, some new discoveries that are being made, some, you know what I mean? That kind of stuff. Why doesn't it feed that, right? Yes. Like you have to specifically seek it out. You have to subscribe to those channels, you know, if you want to watch that. But algorithmic no you know it's all gonna that's all what it's gonna feed you it's gonna feed you gross stuff basically yes right so, and that's why i resent them because I, yeah. I fully believe they have the power 100 percent. they have the power to tweak the algorithms 100 percent. they know what they're doing yeah pieces of shit i want to listen but listen <laughs> uh let's <laughs> let's uh <laughs> let's listen to some music i want to listen to this one this was uh from your album form dictates function function from 2021 and this was a track i dug and it's called and then all vanishes i like this track it's cool it's got this little melody thing that comes in the end that kind of reminded me of metroid prime very influenced yeah so a lot of my music i have to say yeah it's very early video game soundtrack influence there's a lot of those influences in there for sure this is a cool one so let's listen to it this is a and then all vanishes by holland
And that was And Then All Vanishes by Holland. And I'm here with Holland right now. Mark, we're talking about AIs and algorithms and all this stuff. I mean, these are impactful things, right? Like when we look at uh, the things that are happening and, you know, technology is changing. These are very impactful things that are going to have a huge impact on our lives, yeah. right? So. We can go on forever, basically, talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> so, look, we just talked about a whole bunch of other shit here. So let's talk about Holland, man. Like, uh, what are your influences? Yeah, hugely influenced by media, you know, movies. I used to grow I grew up on, like, Aliens and Predator and Terminator. And, you know, I was hugely into that stuff and the early video game stuff. So what, like, what video game stuff are you doing now? Like, what's going on in the, uh, in the Riddiger household? <laughs> so I did play Cyberpunk 2077, right? It didn't have a great start, didn't have a great release, but they patched it up. And man, what an experience. I got to say, man, Johnny Silverhand, Keanu Reeves. Oh, man. <laughs> you know, if you stick with it, I know initially it's pretty rough. Like it had a bad release, right? Yeah, but I didn't get it on release. Like I bought it for 30 bucks on PS5, yeah. like after they did the next generation update. Yeah. And I... Like, I thought it was a great $30 purchase. Honestly, right now, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they patched it up and, uh, you know, it's not like it's not exactly what they promised. No. Uh, they did hype it up initially. But when it comes to cyberpunk, if you're into cyberpunk, man, it's so good. And then Keanu, man, I think it's one of his best roles that he's ever done in this yeah. life, in my opinion. <laughs> like the way he emotes as a video game character, like Keanu's not known for a lot of emoting, right? <laughs> but as Johnny, you know, and if you go through the whole story. I still have to finish it. Yeah. I, uh, again, I get sidetracked. Uh, there's so many things things to play and do and watch and watch yeah they, we're inundated with media right like if even if you know they're not even talking about old uh, new stuff there's tons of old things you can watch right yeah we watch and i'm excited about dune part two i really liked part one villanove our uh, own canadian uh, director yeah. man i'm a huge fan <laughs> of this guy blade runner man i thought you know blade runner is one of my favorite obviously one of yeah. my fav favorite movies like if you're in this scene you know if you're somewhat interested in these topics and you know cyberpunk and video games and futurism and sci-fi and villanove man like Blade Runner is a seminal, you know, work and to follow it up decently, right? Like he did. I was very skeptical, right? Yeah. Like it's such a cult classic and I'm I'm a huge fan of it, right? Ridley Scott and Blade Runner, right? Like huge fan. And when Vin Villeneuve came up with this thing, I went to the theater and I saw how I was shell-shocked, man. The soundtrack, man, where uh, Zimmer, man, uh, man, <laughs> it just knocked my socks off, man. Uh, you know, at the end by the wall there, that, that seawall and when the soundtrack kicks in and the whole atmosphere and Gosling, also Canadian guy, right? He yep, grew up yeah. here. <laughs> and Villeneuve, right? The Canadian director. Loved everything that he's ever done. Yeah. I thought it was a cool movie. Like, I liked it. I liked it too. I know some people... I know that for some people, there were nothing ever top the original yeah which right? is fine I, I get it yeah i get it too it was a seminal defining movie right because you know the aesthetic of it influenced the post cyberpunk cyberpunk aesthetic man he basically set the tone ridley scott and sid mead and and these guys that made that movie basically set the tone of what cyberpunk should look like right yeah and so many people have that idea and, and nothing else can top it yeah my only real flaw with that movie was just i kind of wished that it took place all at night. That's the only thing with Blade Runner. Because right, right. it does have these yeah. daytime scenes. Yeah. I get that they're sort of cloudy. It does. It does at the junkyard there. Yeah, I just, the, I just was yeah. like, that was the one thing. That, that, that there was these sort of shots that took place in the day that was like, you know what? I probably would have right. given this movie one point higher if those were all redone as nighttime shots. For sure. I mean, if you're into that seminal cyberpunk Blade Runner yeah, aesthetic, yeah, yeah. Uh, Villeneuve didn't follow it like 100%. There were some bits and pieces of it. There. But there was parts that were cool. Like, I like that orange shit. Yeah. You know, when they go to fucking yeah. the Vegas <laughs> yeah. and it's all orange and red. Like, that was cool. Yeah, when he sees uh, Decker. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I personally like it because I like Villeneuve. And I, I like uh, the way he he tells stories he unfolds it very slowly mm. right like i know a lot of people don't have the patience for this but he always unfolds like if you watch all of his other movies right the stories unfold very slowly and methodically and you know i appreciate that kind of style of filmmaking because in today in modern triple a cinema you know fast cuts lots of action fast cuts you know yeah. not enough time to for character exposition and this and that so i really appreciated that somebody made a triple a science fiction cyberpunk styled movie you know that kind of art house in a way because it is not an easy movie to watch that requires patience so i do have a ton of appreciation and of course 
now he's done Dune, and you know, Dune is a very difficult book. I just reread it not too long ago. It's an incredibly dense and difficult work, right? So, and he took it, and and Villeneuve took it, and did a pretty decent job, man. I think. What 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 do you think? Did you see it? Yeah, I thought it was cool. I, I don't know the source material really. Like, I only know right. the movie, like the old one. Yeah, the old one. Yeah, <laughs> the old <laughs> with Sting. As, uh, yeah. Yeah. So I thought it was cool. Like for me, I just appreciate, and like it's the same thing I say about Christopher Nolan. Like he just blends the CGI and the practical stuff really well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, very well. Even he uses some models, like physical models, CGI, and and yeah. But I, I, I do understand that Villanova is not as e an easy watch for everybody, right? Because he does very, like the way he unfolds his stories is, is quite slow. I mean, I do appreciate when people make big budget movies that feel like proper films. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, pretty much every big budget thing I watch now is some dumb superhero movie where the story doesn't I, make sense. I was going to say, I was going to say, I'm so, you know, there's fatigue now, right? There's like the superhero fatigue. Yeah. Because Marvel's been pumping out, man, movie after movie. And initially, yeah, sure, Iron Man, man, there were quite a few good movies, right? Yeah. That came out of that uh, genre, right? But now, man, oh boy, that formula is getting so tired. Like even with the last Guardians of the Galaxy, right? I was already uh, like fatigued, even though I did love the, the, the Guardian movies, the first two Guardian movies, right? This 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 third one didn't do it for me. I, I do suffer from the fatigue, like, but to be fair, I think the movies also aren't as good. <laughs> like it's sort of not. multiple yeah. things happening at the same yeah. time. Because I like right. Heroes and I like science fiction and all this stuff. Yep. And I'm just getting really sick and tired of the plots not making sense. Like, I'm just tired of going, why did that character do that? You know why, why did this, this happen? Happening. This is happening because people don't really pay attention to these things anymore. It bugs me. The younger audience, the, the younger audience doesn't really care. You know, I read an interview with the producer of The Witcher. You know, I'm a Witcher fan. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I've read the books. I played the game, The Witcher games, mm -hmm. and and this and then. And then you know, they made the show on Netflix. Yeah. Right. Because you know, I watched the series. I, I watched the first season. And I'm like, man, stuff here just doesn't make sense, man. Yeah. Like the, <laughs> the, the, the way the characters are, the way it's set up, the way the characters are exposition, character exposition, the dialogue. It's just not a lot of it makes sense. And then I read an interview with a producer and he basically says is that that's not a priority to them. That that's just not a priority to them because kids, uh, not just kids, but the younger audiences uh, watch these things and they're mostly on their phone. They're not really paying attention. They're only paying attention when there's some titty and fucking sword sword action on yeah. the screen, basically, <laughs> right? So the, yeah, so, so the producer said basically that that's what they're concentrating on. That, you know, exposition, plot, uh, dialogues are, are basically secondary to them. And I think this is, I think this is happening in AAA cinema in general, right? It's just that they're not, they don't really care a lot. It's just weird because some of the stuff you just think, did anyone read the script before you filmed? Like a lot of these movies I'll watch I where know. like some of this could have been patched up with just a line of dialogue yeah. or yeah. have a character not say a certain thing at a certain time. Like this scene would have not made a, a lot not more a sense. Priority. No, I think it's not a priority to the producers. I think it's not a priority, man. These these movies are made to, they, they just want to make money. Uh, they want to, you know, catch people's attention. It's like clickbait yeah. in a way. It will be now though, because you know, I don't know when this episode going to air but I mean like we're recording right after you know the flash went to cinemas and like all these and movies tanked, yeah. Yeah, by the way you know that yes, right? that's like what I, was, tank, yeah, I think yeah. now and like we're I'm seeing a lot of stories on the entertainment news stuff of like a lot of these companies like starting to sell off their assets now yeah like it's happening with a lot of the big ones yeah I think there's a downturn happening Disney's failing one after the other I mean on the on the series side there's some interesting stuff happening you know on the TV series mm. side right there's some interesting still some interesting uh, things happening the Mandalorian right was good even that that show, I think season one was really good. It was really good, and then it yeah, it sort of. Yeah. I know again, where you're going. <laughs> I, my, my my thing is this: I'm going to bore the yeah. audience with my fucking opinion on this. But like to me, obviously, there's different things that you appreciate in different reasons. Yeah, you know, when I watch The Mandalorian. To me, it's like a live action cartoon. That's the way I feel about it. It, it kind of is. Yeah, it is. So the stories are simple. It doesn't bug me that it's not super complex. And sometimes the characters make dumb decisions, but it's like this shows a cartoon. I mean, Star Wars is in general, if you think yes, about it. Star Wars is simple. It's good versus evil. It's it's a hero's journey, right? Uh, Luke Skywalker, right? was the hero's journey. It was very simple themes, you know, like I completely agree with you. Yeah, like Lucas nailed that, you know, like he he nailed it with the original trilogy. Perfect. It was like we watched them not too long ago right i haven't seen them in like 10 years and i rewatched them with like because you know what when you rewatch things like every like five to ten years mm. you kind of because you know you went through some things in your life like i've had two kids since then like in the last 10 years and you know i had some new experiences and this and that so i, I kind of watch them with like a different eye and man I, I actually have a higher appreciation for the original trilogy than i did back then that's the thing for me it's like okay guys with 
evil looking masks and black capes and <laughs> swords and space battles like it's it's not yeah. complicated when people try and make star wars more nuanced mm-hmm. i'm like not star wars maybe you pull this shit in star trek maybe you do this stuff in Battlestar <laughs> galactica but in star wars i know both of those by the way they'd see the, but like oh you know the, although star trek you know the funny thing is star trek is also kind of not doing great these days but that's because they right? did the opposite yeah. i think they're treating every franchise incorrectly yeah so star trek they turn into a dumb action show yeah whereas the dumb action show should be the star wars you're right you're right because star trek is the sort of the franchise where they go into the gray areas and examine the, and and really examine the, the yeah, political really stuff or yeah the you know the, the, the dilemmas the philosophical and and ethical and all that stuff but star yeah, wars like because yeah. in the last jedi like when they were doing the thing where it's just like who sells the weapons and make the rich mm. people rich by selling the weapons i'm like mm. You don't do this in Star Wars. Star Wars <laughs> is the show where, like, they don't even ever really explain how the fuel works. Yeah. I mean, it's space fantasy, right, in a way. right? Like, like for the nerds, you do have the expanded universe, right? Like, I'm not a Star Wars nerd, but I did, you know, I have friends that are, and from time to time, they, you know, we they do tell me about these things. And I did like some of the games, right? Like uh, Knights of the Old Republic and all that stuff. So it does have a lot of lore, but it, again, it is still science fantasy, I would say. Yes. Right? When I say this stuff, I'm not being restrictive to the creators, obviously. Yeah. You know, they can do whatever they, they want. They can, yeah. but yeah. at the same time, there's reasons why we like the things we like. And so right, absolutely. when I go, okay, I'm a Doctor Who fan, I'm a Star Wars fan, you know, all, Trek, all of these... Yeah. All of these universes, they have space, they have robots, they have spaceships, they have laser fights, they have, you know, human characters as the main characters who have friends with alien species and stuff. But yet, there are certain things, if I was watching an episode of Doctor Who, that if that was an episode of Star Trek, it would feel wrong. Yeah. Right? But as Doctor Who, it works. And the same with the other ones. And so there's a point where you can bend like a franchise to the point where it's, it doesn't feel like the thing anymore. I think you're absolutely correct. I think a lot of the modern producers and, and people behind these things misunderstood. Mm-hmm. I think they misunderstand. I don't think it's deliberate. I'm not 100% sure if they're doing it deliberately. I uh, that, that, you know, they're, oh, we're going to shift, thematically shift. People yeah. don't care. Like, it's, it's a money thing. It's like... Well, number one, you're right. Like Disney, let's be honest, man. Disney just wants to make money. Yes, and they fucked yeah. up. Honestly, when I when I think about this the Disney Star Wars trilogy, I'm thinking, yeah. if they just delivered three mediocre Star Wars films, yeah. that would have ultimately been better than yeah. kind of fucking you know, the franchise. You know, what, you know what's funny is that when I talk to a lot of the people that are into Star Wars and stuff like that, that they tell me that the prequel trilogy, which everybody hated yeah. at the time when it came out, right? That they thought, man, you know, like that they, they were derided and you know, attack. Of the clones and all that stuff they were derided they were made fun of and this and that but uh, people have a new appreciation yeah. for those you know having seen the new one <laughs> well, i can't say that's happened to me but I- <laughs> <laughs> but look man listen uh we've been uh, we've been talking for a long time and it's always just a certain amount of time before we get into the star wars talk so i think listen we should uh listen to some music and then uh maybe wind down because we've been uh, talking for a long time so let's listen to this one from your album paths diverse Uh, This is complete and self-contained.
And that was Complete and Self-Contained by Holland. And uh, I've been chatting to Holland today. Mark, we got heavy into the nerd talk there. I uh, <laughs> We talk about this all the time on the show, like where, you know, this franchise went wrong or where this movie franchise fucked up. And I, I think I'm just starting to realize that the problem is like the idea of the franchise itself maybe these things just aren't meant to be a series yeah that's another thing i think you're you're right about that <laughs> man i think some things should have like man they're making a blade runner tv series now mm. and i don't know if that's a great i mean i'm a huge fan of the blade runner universe and blade runner in general but man i don't know if that's a great thing turning into a, into a, some kind of a franchise with a tv show a tv series and i mean the universe and lore and everything is there but man maybe show some things should be left alone and i think you're i think you've got that right man don't turn it into another marvel man Maybe it is just that you just can't do too many. It's like the same with television shows. Yeah. I think there's a certain amount of time or a certain amount of years where afterwards shows just all always decline. Like a lot of the, the greatest shows, you get like a good five seasons. Yeah. And then they all just kind of slowly start to lose quality. Yeah. And yeah. we're lucky for the the handful of shows that remained good all the way to the end. Yeah. Which is rare. Which is it's rare. It's super rare. Yeah. And same with the superhero thing. It's just maybe, you know, maybe it's just it's time had come. Like I think it, uh, it is time to lay off. I mean, we had some good superhero flicks, right? Like Logan, like the more darker ones, rated R, you know, stuff. Yeah. Even though there were like, there were a bunch of fun films in the, in the Marvel run and stuff, but then nothing still yeah. tops my favorites, which are the ones that I watched when I was younger. Like, I still love the yeah. the Tim Burton Batmans and the Sam Raimi Spider-Mans. Yeah. And yeah. like... Yeah. I think that also has to do with some nostalgia. Like, you were younger and, and you know what I mean? Like, you attach some... Like, listen, look with us and Synthwave, for example, right? Like, for, for us, older guys, right? Like, a little bit older. I grew up with, like, Pet Shop Boys and Depeche Mode and some of the soundtracks, uh, you know, of the 80s and all that stuff. So when Synthwave can... I heard Synthwave about 14 years ago, 13. Oh, wasn't it Kavinsky uh, that did, like, the Drive soundtrack that was the seminal originator of it's that. so funny because it's just that one song yeah. and it's the fact that drive starts with the the hot pink yes. words that say drive and it's playing yes. that particular track that truck yes and that's all it took because he doesn't do the oh. score it's it's a, it's a clint no it's clint manzel i think yeah. that does the yeah actual score yeah, and it's, it's, it's absolutely fascinating how it all started in my opinion like it's because i've been watching the scene like i'm not 100 in this scene mm. right like in the synthwave stuff i do take elements from it i do love certain elements uh, of synthwave but i don't incorporate everything i don't make i had never i don't think i've ever made a pure synthwave track but i do i am fascinated by the scene and the music and everything and i do follow the scene and it was fascinating to w watch it unfold it was absolutely fascinating you know like the early releases mm. right laser hawk was one of the first right remember that album at, at kavinsky was like the, i watched that movie and i'm like man those bass lines i mean that reminds me of something yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that, you know what i mean like because you know i grew up in the late 80s like i was a kid in the late 80s early 90s and all those movies and everything man that like when i saw that i'm like man and it, it instantly hit me like how for me personally that that nostalgic note and i'm like man this is amazing stuff right and then when i started hearing hearing the other stuff right that's for coming from other people i'm like wow this is going to be interesting. You remember dubstep was the big thing at the time, yeah. right? <laughs> when, when, and I, I, you know, I got to be honest with you, man. I, I, I'm, I'm not a fan, right? Like I'm not a fan of dubstep. Well, neither am I. I'm, I'm not a fan of, of. I mean, for me, I like cool bass lines and nice melodies, yeah, and uh, you know, harmonies and arpeggios and nice fat yeah. chords and so hooks, you know, some good hooks. Yeah, and I, right? I'm less interested in music that's all about just the rhythm kind of thing and like you know dubstep is bass yeah bass bass and rhythm the yeah. dubstep yeah. never interested me because it's just you know it's a whoop, 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 whoop. i'm like i don't yeah the whoop right so for me personally because you know I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a kind of a musician too i'm a producer and a musician so i've been doing it for a while man that whoop it just drove me nuts yeah. man when at the time <laughs> and it was it was in freaking insurance commercials yeah. okay and it was like it was so 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 i was so glad when it went away and the retro stuff took over because the retro stuff is now everywhere man even in like the week and you know 103 point never you know i don't know if you know this guy 103 point never he does this retro ambient experimental stuff and he he's working with the weekend doing like this retro kind of sound right so the so retro retroism in general i think it's it's big man it's everywhere now and you know what that's a great thing because i love it yeah <laughs> if i'm walking in a mall i would rather hear generic synth wave in the background i completely agree than this fucking pop country whatever the shit you know like yeah. they play on the radio over here yeah. and stuff like yeah even the generic 
synth wave is still I love as just background. Yeah, it's great. You know what? Because 80s music in general, and and you know, synth wave is an iteration. It uses modern production techniques, but it takes like the composition and the the, the way it you know the song progresses. It's from the 80s, like it's straight out 80s, right? Yeah. Style stuff. It just uses modern production techniques and uh, that stuff. You know, 80s music, man, it's just great. Yeah, I don't I don't care what anybody <laughs> says. I listen to like I listen to everything, like metal. I grew up a little like I was a little, for a bit there. I was a rebel and I was a little bit of a metal head and I used to listen to like really heavy stuff, Pantera and all that stuff, like really heavy uh, Fear Factory and all that stuff. But then, you know, I, I circled back and I, I and I started listening back to the 80s stuff and synth wave and, and all that stuff. So, and, and, and I just got to say, man, 80s is just, man, it's just timeless. Yes. It's just timeless. Like the progressions, the melodies, the, oh man, it's just great. As I'm getting older, I'm, I'm actually more into it than I was yeah. back in the day. <laughs> the bass lines are great, man. And the sounds are cool. Yeah, the sounds are cool. The syncopated bass lines are great. Yeah, I'm a fan, man. I, I think I'll always be 80s and, and, and even the new stuff, the retro. I hope it doesn't go away, honestly. You know, like how like dubstep faded away. Yeah. I hope that, uh, <laughs> you know, it did. It, like, it did you don't hear dubstep anywhere. I mean, people are still doing it. There are still like hardcores that do jungle dubstep and drum and bass and all that stuff, right? But I hope that, you know, synthwave and retro and outrun and all that stuff, it doesn't go away. I hope it just stays, hopefully. Well, that's a lovely sentiment to end on. We've been talking for a very long time. <laughs> yeah, it's a great conversation, man. Great conversation. So, I'm going to let you go, but... Um it's been nice talking to you. You make cool music. Thank you very much. People should go uh, check out the music of Holland on uh, Bandcamp. That's your main place, right? Yeah, it's SoundCloud and Bandcamp. See, seek out, because, uh, you know, I do drop, like, the way I produce, I, I'm going to go a little bit of a tangent. The way I produce is I, I do a lot of, pro like, I, I produce a lot. I have, you know, I have this uh, workflow and method that I can do a lot of music, right? So I worked it out over the years, right? I cut down all the beat to the bone where it's like everything that's necessary is in the music. Everything that's not is out. So I can do a lot of music. So uh, SoundCloud, Bandcamp are my two main outlets these days. So from time to time, I release full albums, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll collect the best works. I, I, I'll rework it, remix it, change the mix, you know, re-engineer it a little bit. I'll put it up on Bandcamp, but, but mostly I just drop tracks from uh, SoundCloud and, and I also enable... Uh, the download function so you can download all those tracks if you want if you want to listen to it locally on your device see look at that you're a very generous man with your art you know what because in this scene and in this niche i think i just want people to listen right like if they want to share that aesthetic vision with me i like right that's i want them to listen i want people to hear that's why i you know i don't really care i give it away and if you love it great man I, i'm you know i'm glad yeah 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 well, look, man, you have a lovely Oshawa day. Oh, yeah, the schwa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, these days, these days it's not that bad, that bad GM. You know, it's a GM town, General Motors, uh, big factory in the south there. There used to be like 40, 50,000 people working here in three shifts, 24 seven. Mm. So this was a factory town, but uh, that's gone now. GM has uh, only like an electric line here that produced like one line of electric vehicles. And now we're a university town. Uh, there's a, I live in the north uh, part of the town where there's this thing called the University of Ontario here and it's expanding so it's more of a university town so yeah the dirty schwa moniker is going away <laughs> that's like people ask you where are you from man i'm from the dirty schwa well that was because of gm mm -hmm. right and the feeding factories and because they used to you know make seats here and that kind of stuff that's all gone that's been turned down and a costco yeah. has been installed <laughs> <laughs> has been put in the old spot right so that's that's all schwa these days yeah yeah all right man well look all right it was uh, good talking yeah, is there any well. new uh, music on the way you want to tease probably uh, something in the fall I'll you know start working on an album as I as I get a little bit older uh, working on albums was getting a little bit more difficult because I have to put a lot of like production like you said a lot of busy work is involved yes. right there is no chat GTP for music at this moment yeah. <laughs> to simplify the you know the EQing the technical stuff right yeah. so I have to put in the work and making albums because everything has to be consistent and the music has to be consistently mixed and this and that you know when I dump it on SoundCloud it's just individual tracks right so I don't really care about you know I do the mix the best I can and I dump it and the way it comes the way it is but for albums I have to take care, right? I have to make sure. There's a lot of work. So hopefully there'll be something. And I do put uh, put out some exclusive tracks that only end up on Bandcamp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, in the album. So hopefully something in the fall. If things, you know, I have a couple of kids that I, you know, they keep me very busy these days. Sure. So, <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Well, you take care. Thanks. Yeah, you take care. Thanks for having me. Yeah, cheers, dude. Bye. Cheers. All right, and that was my chat with Holland. 
He's a cool guy. I enjoyed uh, that talk. We talked for a really long time. I think I mentioned this last week, but I was trying to record conversations and keep them at one hour to make the editing easier for myself. But then sometimes you start talking to somebody and you get into nerd topics and then you just end up talking for three hours and it's like, ah, shit. Anyways, I hope you all have a lovely week. Thank you so much for listening to Beyond Synth. And uh, don't forget, if you enjoy the show, uh, you can support it at patreon.com slash beyondsynth. Uh, There's also a PayPal link if you go to beyondsynth.com. I probably will have to sign up to these new stupid social media things, but I don't want to. But uh, I do have an account on Blue Sky now if you're there. And uh, I guess I'll fucking join threads. God damn it. (laughs) Fuck. Honestly, as long as these places are starting as shitty as Twitter, but I think Twitter just burned me in a way where I just don't like using social media for anything other than just the business of posting the Beyond Synth show links and stuff. Because yeah, like whenever I would say a sentence of just like, hey, I thought this movie was cool or I wasn't a big fan of this movie, it just ends up being this chain of people you don't know fighting with you. And so there was this point where I was like, I think I'm done with this. Like, it just wasn't fun anymore. But who knows, maybe these new things will be more fun but i'm very 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 skeptical anyways have a lovely week a lovely weekend keep being cool tune in next time to beyond synth it's the best synth wave chat show there is beyond synth radio is produced by andy last check the show notes for more information on the musicians featured on the show Beyond Synth is made possible by listeners like you. Consider supporting Beyond Synth at patreon.com slash beyondsynth. Thanks for listening.